second session today about uh, designing the real world and agile processes in the real world and how it looks to user experience, okay, in this course particularly. Okay, so first of all, well first of all, who's worried about their exam? The masses of work that you now have to read. Okay, we're all worried about it. Good. It's good to be worried about your exam, but don't be too worried, okay? So even though there's a lot of work here, there's looks like there's a lot of paper, a lot of stuff to read, most of it is contained within the lectures, slides, as you can all know. And secondly, you've also got to realise that I'm providing more information in these notes. Why am I providing more information in these notes? Why am I providing more information that you need to revise in these notes? Because we're all going to be user experience experts. You all are going to be user experience experts. And at some point, because I've only got 24 hours to teach this in, you guys are going to have to you know, have some background. So that's what part of the actual notes are about. So there's so many, that's why there's sort of suggested reading, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So don't be too worried about verbatim memorising these notes. As long as you understand what the course material is about, it's going to be far more about your original thought, your creativity, and your ability to synthesise ideas and put them together. Okay, with what with your other computer science work. Yeah. Okay. Laura, who's Laura? There's Laura. Laura. Okay. So now, did you find that answer about the um, what to write for your um, for your? Well, it's voice yeah, notes. Yeah, voice notes. I, okay. I posted it on the Facebook group. I posted it on the Facebook group about the coursework uh, for everybody. Okay. It clearly what Watson said. I, I personally didn't realise it was when you said about if you read your, you know, your piece of material and it could be written by anybody who wasn't a user experience specialist, then you need to change it. Yeah. That's what clarifies it. Yeah, that's right. So it should all be on the Facebook group. Um, there's more left on the side. Uh, it should all be on the Facebook group. Yes. No, no, the Facebook group. Oh yeah, you're kind of in the dark age of no Twitter either. <laughs> Oh, okay, uh, so I'll put that on the um, I'll put that on the website. So I'll make a new entry on the website so you can see what the actual advice is. But in general, um, hopefully it's made it a lot clearer and you've still got time to do stuff. It's the next one is this voice loops on spatial uh, paper. Yeah? Okay. Alright. So from last time, uh, pop quiz. So all of this was years ago. Um, what is it good to know if effective principles, principles of effective experience, of uh, really capturing software correctly? Why is that difficult to understand? What's the key part of emotion and effective work? Oh, no, 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 it's very difficult to quantify. You can get quantitative data from it, and it's very, what's the word I'm looking for? Use the S. Subjective. Subjective as opposed to objective. So, a lot of the stuff to do with the emotional experience of the person um, is related to lots of other things. Okay? Those other things might be called in a study, begins with C. Confounding variables. Confounding variables, yes, that's what we're thinking. Okay. Um, so, that's, that's something you need to think about. Um, why is effective computing different to effective experiences? So who's doing a lot of work in effective computing? We talked about this kind of olfactory stuff with uh, Stephen Brewster up in the, um, Glasgow on smell. What about the stuff, what, what's the other kind of effective computing that's being done? Not in this country, though. Where's the place for it? And what is it? Okay, so... The work has been done at MIT, really, okay, by Rosalind Picard's group. And this effect, effective computing is different to effective experience because effective computing suggests that we are at some point can allow computers to recognise emotion and to then have emotion. Okay? 
Whereas effective experience is more about understanding what the emotion of the users are in relation to the computer itself, okay, and the interface, and their, their whole interactive um, pattern. Yeah? So there's a difference. So make sure, sure you don't confuse these two points together, okay? Because they're not the same thing. Um, does how visual aesthetics and visual complexity relate to each other? This is a very good, very good little thing, Seasock. Seasock chair. Coming late. Okay. And there's more notes just there as well. Okay, so, any ideas? How do visual aesthetics and visual computer complexity relate to each other? If you'd have been to the museum, not museum, the gallery, you'd have known this was from anyway. Okay, we're going to have to think about that. Find that out, it's in the notes. How does narrative art relate to the principle of flow? When did I talk about the principle of flow? So does anyone remember the yerkes dodson curve of arousal? The yerkes dodson curve? What? No? Yes? No. Just vaguely. It's all just coming back to you now, isn't it, after this three week, four week holiday? Have you been revising this subject in your Easter vacation? Who's been revising? <coughs> One. <laughs> so you're all worried about your exam, but no revision. <laughs> It'll be fine. Okay. Okay. So, we know the principle of flow. Why do we know the principle of flow from? That long and pronounceable name of the author. No? You don't know the flow diagram where we... Can you remember this diagram? Something that looks like that, where you've got flow here, and you've got... Uh, too much, no, too much excitement here and too little here, or the other way around. Yeah? Okay, so how does narrative, narrative art relate to that? For your original thought question, worth six marks of each exam. Question you would get. What do you mean by narrative art? Well, what do I mean by narrative art? <laughs> I knew you'd ask that. It's in the notes. And the visual aesthetics. It's really used to tell the story. Yeah. Like painting or something. Okay. Yeah. I figured it might be something like that. Okay. Alright, so I'll be expecting you to be able to maybe make a stab at this in original thought questions, possibly. Why is emotion difficult to quantify? What is one possible solution? Well, we know why emotion is difficult to quantify because it's subjective. What's a possible solution? Yes. You could try to infer emotions from expressions by looking at parts of the face. Very good. You could try to infer emotion from expressions by uh, yeah, gaze detection, and, yeah, looking at uh, looking at facial expressions, facial recognition. Anything else? <coughs> how to do um, building and the design principles for design and build. And in here we're going to look at value, validating what you've built, what you've designed, whether, that's, whether the requirements have been translated accurately and correctly into um, a design, okay, into a build. So there's plenty of ways to do that. But it all relies, at least here, it all relies on the scientific method. Okay? So here we can see badly designed work equals incorrect analysis. 
Okay? So if you've got a badly designed experiment, you've got a badly designed piece of work, you're going to get an incorrect analysis. Because the analysis that will look right, because it's based on this data you've collected, but it's the wrong data. Okay? So if I was linking two pieces of the course together from your synthesis marks on your exam, then what, what could I think about? What could I link together, maybe, from some of the first two or three lectures we had? Where was this? Where did they get badly designed experiment gives incorrect analysis? So, yes? Was it when they made their uh, personas that were too general? No, not quite. Yeah? Was it when you have survey or something but there's bias in it? So... Survey bias, yes. Yeah. So, give us an example of that. So, Coke. Who remembers the Coke story? Yes? Okay, so tell me. The server, the group. Yeah. When they, so Coke wanted to have a new, uh, cheaper kind of Coke. I imagine it was. That's the only reason companies do stuff, isn't it? Um, so a cheaper kind of Coke. And so what they did was they did some surveys to, and some um, uh, tastings, supposedly blind tastings, to understand which was the best. And they got results that said the new one was the best one. But it wasn't, because nobody liked it, it flopped, and everybody went to Mexico to buy this stuff made of corn syrup. Okay? Which is Coke, Coke made of corn syrup. Um, and that's because the experimenters knew which, which Coke they were tasting, so it wasn't particularly blind, and there was experimental bias that generally this is the one that they choose. Okay? Okay. So incorrect analysis equals incorrect conclusions. Quite obvious, which means that the success of your in interventions are in doubt. So, if you don't do this bit right, everything else that you've done may not be right. It may be right, but it may not be right. And in reality, this means that if you don't get this lesson right, the past 207 pages that you've been reading are worth crap. Okay, don't mean anything. This is important. If you don't, if you aren't able to understand your evaluation, if you aren't able to understand. Um, how the requirements analysis has translated through the design and development process into a product at the end, you don't have any, you know, all everything else is gone. It doesn't matter. Okay? So it's important. Okay, now to do this we need to understand science. So, let's go back a bit and say, who knows anything about science? Being computer scientists, who knows anything about science? Yes? A little bit. Go on then. I saw this thing yesterday, it was about when the whole principle of what science involves was changed only about 150 years ago, something like that. Okay. Four guys at Cambridge having a, a little chat. Basically changed everything to be, rather than natural philosophy, it became science. That's the, way, that's the way forward, yeah. That's good. So, uh, well, I've told you this bit about natural philosophy and art, the difference between the two, right? Who wants to tell me that? Nothing. And also, where, where did you find that? Um, I think it was a TED talk, maybe. Okay, so I'll tweet can you it. tweet it? Yeah. Okay, so what's the difference between natural science and art? What was the how is it grouped together in the old days? Oh, Come on, it's only been Easter. Okay, so natural science was all about the things that God made, an investigation of the things that God made. And art was the things, an investigation of things that humans made. That was how it was originally sectioned. So natural science might be things like, uh, natural philosophy, sorry, might be things like um, physics, and physics and chemistry, it's not chemical engineering, biology. But things like computer science would fall under art. Things like mechanical engineering would fall under art. So there's not such a big divergence between what we think to be art and science and engineering. That wasn't seen in, in the past. Okay, it was slightly, the things that we make, the engineering aspects that we make in that study was seen as um, art. Okay, so that's been tweeted. Okay, so anybody wants to know it, tell me anything more about science. Can I prove something in um, experimental science? Can I, can I prove it, definitively prove it, that in empirical work with, with people? Yes. No, it was proved that something holds under some conditions 
or you can prove something false by just finding one false example. Yes. So that's exactly right. So therefore, the, 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 you can get proof in theoretical work, possibly, okay, because you're working in a closed world. But in a real open world, then that's more difficult to do. And so we can only support our uh, hypotheses, we can only support our theories, um, if we ha have multiple cases which don't fail. Or we can prove them wrong because we only need one case to fail. But we're never sure that we've tested all cases. So we can't prove it. So how do we get around this in, in, in this work, in this kind of work, or in lots of work? How do we get around this inability to prove something, to just support it? You can have like a confidence value or something for the research that you're doing. Yeah. And then you can say, if this value exceeds, I don't know, some kind of threshold and industry standard, then you can conclude that it's likely that you have the result that you want. Yes, and that is statistical analysis. So we can do some statistical analysis, especially if we've got some more kind of um, quantifiable metrics as opposed to quality metrics. Okay? Okay, so science is all about generalization. What we're trying to say is mainly if we take a small sample of a population, how can we generalize that their experiences and their thoughts and feelings and wishes, etc., will be transferable to the majority of the population? That there's a generalization of the work. Otherwise, we can only speak about individuals or individual groups. Now, if we're speaking about an individual sample, and we've only got a small individual sample, and we're talking about the sample, we, can't, we might not be able to generalize it. So what can we do? We can just talk about the sample itself, that's all we can do, and say, and leave it to, pe to other people to make their decision about whether they think it's generalizable, but we might not be able to use any metrics that allow us to, to support that, any data that allows us to support that. And that's called internal validity. What's sort of internal validity? No. Okay. Okay, well, that's called internal validity. Okay. So. We have different ways of doing this. So we've got inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. And inductive reasoning, we're mainly talking about the empirical method. Okay, we're talking about science. So here we're saying um, evaluation applies to the general population of abstracts of observations of individual instances of members of the same population. So I could say that as students, your experience might be about this lecture might, will be, might be shared by all of you by just questioning five of you. Okay, and then I induce that these five are a good sample, they're representative of the rest of you, and then that means that you all think the same. And indeed, your course evaluation questionnaires often get filled in by half, which is pretty good actually, of this population, i.e. you guys, and we can then induce that that's transferable, that value of whatever you decide to give me in the end for your course evaluation questionnaires is the same for everybody in the course, all 79 of them. Now, who's done um, description logics, semantic web stuff, logics in general? Okay, some people, okay, you're also not that fine. So this one here, deductive reasoning, is what you often get in things like description logics, ontologies, um, the owl ontology language, and semantic web kind of work, where we say that the first we make a um, we make a premise and then we, we follow a set of steps from that premise and that's how we conclude an endpoint. So we can say that herbivores only eat plant matter, all vegetables contain only plant matter, all cows are herbivores, therefore vegetables are suitable food for cows. Yeah? Does that make sense? And you see this a lot in, in description logic, in, um, in ontology languages. All right, who's seen the pizza ontology? Okay, one, pizza ontology, that's quite famous ontology. There's another ontology which is about uh, mad cow disease, obviously, which uh, the reasoners that, uh, through, that uh, created it for looking at deductive reasoning um, come up with a big flashing thing where you're feeding cows on their own themselves. Because uh, obviously cows are supposed to be herbivores, but you're obviously feeding them on bits of, them, bits of other cows, which is why they got mad cow disease. Yeah? Okay. So, the conclusion must be true provided that the premise is true. So these set of premises have to be true for the conclusion to be true. Okay? Therefore, you could not say that um, all cows eat vegetables. 
Because fruit also contains plant matter. So does uh, grass and trees. Yeah? Okay. But the thing we're looking at is inductive reasoning. Okay? Because we're working in a real in the real world, not in this kind of um, sort of uh, constrained world often. So we're mainly looking at this inductive reasoning step where we're looking at where we're looking to apply um, things we understand from a sample into a general population. So, who knows who the 1968 Turing Prize winner is? Go on, can't you pull that out? I don't actually, I forgot his name. Uh, Richard, his first name is, but I forgot his second name. So I'm as bad as the rest of them, you know, I'm trying to push them on. Okay, so um, he had a really excellent, uh, he has a really excellent quote in a number of his books, and the first one is that if you know what you're doing in science, you're not doing it right. Okay? And if you don't know what you're doing in engineering, you're not doing it right. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the difference that he's making. So here, we probably don't know what we're doing in science, we don't know what the end point might be, okay, because it's a scientific discovery. Okay, we're trying to discover things that we don't already know about the world, such that we can create this model of understanding which is expanded. Okay? But in engineering, we probably do need to understand what we're doing, because if we don't understand that, bridges fall down. Okay? We have good uh, models that allow us to uh, model engineering-based aspects. Yeah? So computer science sits in both domains. You've got some engineering and some science. Okay? I would imagine that this course is probably as science as it gets okay, in, in, in this school. You've got a lot more engineering. Building programs is far more about engineering. Okay? Seeing how they perform when they're distributed is more about science. Yeah? Okay. So a method of inquiry must be based on gathering of observable, empirical and measurable evidence and be subject to scientific principles of reasoning. And so, scientific bedrock looks a lot like this. You'll see lots of different versions of this, so this isn't definitive by any means. But we have, and, and where we start, well, it's all looking there. So, we're gonna, as we're going to come on to see, we, here we're supposed to start with hypotheses. Okay? But, next week, we'll be looking at grounded theory, which means that we don't necessarily start with hypotheses. Okay? We, look, we use observation to, to kind of generate some hypotheses. Okay? So first, we generate, but, but let's just do the simplified version for this week. We, do, we generate hypotheses, we have procedures, experimental procedures, on which we want to enact, which we want to enact over some, some resource. Okay? And from that we get results, we get data. And from that data, we can analyse that data, and we can analyse it correctly, or we can analyse it, analyse it incorrectly, there's a lot of, lot of errors that can be made in the analysis. And then we get findings and conclusions, which either supports our hypotheses or doesn't. Okay? Which allows us to maybe change the hypotheses if we want. Refine them, change them about. Okay. So. Who knows about black swans? Who knows anything about black swans? Aren't they Australian? <coughs> yeah, they are. Okay, so back in the day, 500 years ago, no, everybody thought swans were white. All observable evidence was that swans were white. Okay? That was it. So, we went from Europe, swans were white. We go to America, swans are white. Swans are white. And in the context of um, Europe and, um, and uh, specifically the British, when I'm, trying, when I'm saying uh, we go to America, what I'm saying is we're conquering all these places. And we're going to like that because we're even like that. Okay, so that's pretty much what we do. Um, and we find that in all instances, this one's alright. So here we can say that our hypothesis is supported. Okay, that, that's it. And you'll also notice something about that hypothesis. It's easy to break. Because one, one instance of a colour change from a swan, from not be from white to something else, the hypothesis is not supported anymore, it's broken. Okay? It's not that some swans are white. Some swans are white isn't very strong because that's likely to be proven in just one instance. A swan being white. <coughs> okay, so then we go to Australia. And we see all these strange looking birds that look a lot like swans but they're black. Okay? 
And it turns out that in Australia, that's where we have the one instance of black swans. That we've got black swans in Australia. So therefore, that's why the hypothesis was strong. It was originally supported with the available observable evidence that we had. And then we generalised that to all swans in the world until we come up with one observable difference which breaks the very brittle hypothesis. The more brittle the hypothesis, the stronger you can be sure of it being correct if you can't find any alternate cases. Does that make sense? Yeah? Do we all get that? Okay. Alright. So this is the kind of hypothesis that you should be creating in your, say, third year projects when you're doing user, user work with in your third year projects. Who's kind of going to analyse users? One. Two, three, four. I mean, it's a new course. Why hasn't everybody got their hands up? Yes, we need to analyse users. Four. So when you do analyse users, what kind of hypotheses are you going to have? Your system, they like our system. It's good. Is that kind of... No? What, what do you think? Uh, behaviour models. Yeah? Behaviour models. What are they? Okay, good. So behaviour models, whether they're going to behave in a certain way. Um, and so we can do some prediction of those behavioural models, using those behavioural models. Uh, what kind of behavioural models would we exist that we've already seen? Gomes. Gomes is one, yeah. Good job to identify where users click and how long it takes them to click certain buttons and areas on the screen. Yeah, how long it takes to uh, click certain buttons and areas on the screen, and that'll be related to where their cursor was before. So. Can we calculate that? The, the time and the possible distance it takes? How? Can we predict it? We've got to go out to take them quite a few times and then find an average. What happens if somebody's already done that? So you've all heard about Fitz Law before? Yeah? So we could predict it using Fitz Law. What are the kind of models that are related to games are there? Science is mostly done by white middle class males, and therefore the things they're interested in are going to be the things that we expand science along the direction of, okay? as opposed to the entire model of the work. So, that's, so there's lots of discussions about gender bias in uh, scientific um, uh, discovery, there's lots of discussions about um, uh, race bias, there's lots of different discussions about uh, country bias, ideology bias. Okay? Because even though science is meant to be, um, well, you'll not need to believe anything in science. Generally, you've got some good work, and then you can, uh, you've got enough good work, and you can make a decision about whether, with statistical analysis and repeatability, whether the, science, the scientific outcome is appropriate or correct. How we actually decide what we're going to investigate is another, is another thing. What avenues are important for us to to, to go down to another thing. Okay, we can make some inductive leaps, okay, if they're based on good science. So even though you might not have all of the information you need to make a decision as to whether your development is correct or whether what people are telling you is correct, we can make some good leaps on this. So you might do some work yourselves, you might get some sort of income, in, in, 
inconclusive results, okay? or maybe results that don't seem to be statistically significant. What have I said before about statistical significance? Okay. Well, there's a video of me ranting about it, so um, maybe you should look at that before the full holidays. Okay. In the user experience domain, when it comes to this kind of quantitative stuff, we use statistical analysis. When it comes to qualitative stuff, we use other methods. Okay. We know, and what other methods might we be using? What kind of methods might exist as quantitative analysis? As qualitative analysis, sorry. Ethnographic coding. Conversations with a purpose. You've heard of all these before. You've done them before. Yeah. So these kind of things you need to uh, think about. Focus groups. Might be useful. Okay. So statistical methods allow us to generalise our results. Okay. They like the letters say if this population has been accurately um, sampled, and it's, the sample is a good representation of the population. Okay, then it means that if we enact some work over that, which gives us metrics which are quantifiable, then we can actually say something important and interesting, and we can generalise that to the rest of the population. So if I just picked uh, U3 as the representative sample from this group, from this population, would that be a good representative sample, do you think? No. Oh, you guess U3, I think it is, don't you? Yes, we're pretending. Okay, any ideas? No. No. Why not? Well, first of all, all three are white. So yes. That doesn't represent yeah. Yeah. <coughs> the, the ethnicity of the group. Um, all of them are male, so you know, three women have. Yeah. Um, age difference, I'm the eldest here. I'm the eldest here. Yeah, these three. Okay, yeah, good. Yes. They're all pretty close to the front. They're all close to the front. What does that suggest, possibly? Well, no, no, no. Or it just means that they're under my line of sight, so I'm looking at this and back, and these kinds of guys are sitting under the hood. Yeah? Yes? Um, they're probably friends, so they might have the same views on things, and it won't, it's not completely random, so. That's true. So they're probably friends, and they might have, you know, they might, they might all have the same views. Yeah, similar views. Okay, so. We're going to see how to draw a really nice sample later on. Okay, so, uh, yes? Sorry, yeah, just to touch on the whole thing. If you're going to make a sample and it's only three out of 50 people, mm -hmm. that's it. I mean, most of us here are white and male. So mm -hmm. I would say that that is, I mean, okay, I think the French point is the, most, is the best point, right? But it turns out three people are making each other friends, and they're all going to say, have similar viewpoints, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. What to pick three people and to have them all being white male in computer science when most of us are white male. That 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 is I wouldn't say that that's a uh, unrepresentative. So there are definitely going to be people who are not represented, but if you can't have such a small sample size, then you would as the person picking the sample size, you should understand that you're going you know, the smaller the sample size, the less fine brain detail you can have. Okay, and that's a good point. So if that's the case, with three people, do you think you'd be able to um, get a good scientific outcome, a good, a, a, a correct outcome for what we're actually trying to generalise? Or do you think that three is too few, and the reality is that you need more than that to accurate, accurately represent the group? And, and that when you get bigger numbers, if you've got ten, then you could probably have a difference, you know, that, that kind of um, granularity. But do you think from three, whether they, do you think three is an accurate representation, or it's too small to be an accurate representation, really, and you need to be bigger. So these are decisions you have to make in the, in the domain. I would suggest that three is too small, and we need, need to have more in this particular sample to get an accurate representation. Um, but I, but it's, a, it's a reasonable point that you're making, and it's a reason, yes? Um, what if, as the designer of, of the experiments, or, or the person choosing the sample, you're not aware? of the general distribution of age and gender and, and ethnicity in the group, what if you 
only see those three people and you don't know anything about anyone else, how do you then um, evaluate whether that's a good sample? Okay, so I've chosen these three people because they're convenient. And that's called a convenient sample because they're right here and they're in front of me. And I noticed they've been sort of semi-sleeping a bit. So I've been, uh, I've been I've, you know, picked them up, they're convenient. Okay? So if I, if I didn't know anything about the population, which of course I don't, I don't know anything about the greater population. If, I, if there's hundreds of people, I have no idea necessarily what their makeup might be. So what I do is choose a random sample. Okay? So a random sample is meant to be, a truly random sample is meant to be that I, that some system, um, there are random number tables which allow you to do this, choose randomly numbers. Okay? And then you associate numbers with people and pick those numbers. So you might um, choose social security number. Okay? So everybody's got a social security number, uh, theoretically, or a passport number, or a student ID card number here. And you might say, of all the, all the population of all the student ID cards that we've got here, we choose a random sample based on some random sample tables. And that way, it says that, I, that the chances of it... The chances of me getting a representative sample are higher because I'm choosing randomly, I'm not choosing a convenient sample. Now, if you've got a very small population in a small sample, this is too small, but if you've got a small population in a small sample, then you might want to understand what the demographics are by counting the population, or say, understand the population from the census, and then try to represent that population based, based on the diversity of that population, you might want to represent them. And that's the way that, say, Mori polls are done. They have a thousand people that they're going to interview, and that, those thousand people are created based on the knowledge of the census data of what the population is made up of, of the demographic, different demographic types. And that's how they rep make an accurate representation. Yeah? Is that too much information at the moment? Or do we all understand that? Yeah? Is that, yeah? Okay. Right, so, I'm going to get on to populations later, okay, uh, how we choose a proper and accurate sample, okay, and the kind of sampling there is, because there's lots of different kinds of sampling, and it might also be that um, if you don't have enough um, people, so what's in statistical stuff that I was ranting about just the week before you all went away and got everything about user experience on holiday, um, what was I ranting about with regard to statistics and um, p-values and statistical significance? You're all asleep, weren't you? You're just happy to be leaving. Okay, so I was saying that a p-value, what's a p-value? It's the outcome of a null hypothesis test. Yeah, it's a probability, so it's about, it's, it's a, the p-value is a probability that you set it using an alpha level that is the set point, and then you see whether that alpha level can, can which is theoretically set, then you see whether that conforms to the p-value, which is after the, after the experiments occurred, okay, the analysis has occurred. So p-values are set at uh, often 0.05, okay? But I was riding against that because in the work we do, population, the p-value is very sensitive to the population, to the, to the, not population, to the sample size, okay, to the number of participants you have. So here, to be very difficult to get anything accurate with just these three guys out to 79. Okay, because your, the stats will come back going too little data, pretty much the p-value. We can't be confident about this. Okay, so well, there's one, the one way to increase this is to do something called bootstrapping. Has anybody heard of bootstrapping? Okay, so bootstrapping is where we have these three guys and we analyse your data, we analyse your data, we analyse your data, we put it back into a jar, and then we do the same again as many times as we like until we get a population that we until we get um, the number of participants we want. So we can go from 3 till three, to 300, even though they're the same kind of participants. The only reason this works is because they're an accurate sample of the... Um, they're an accurate representation of the population, drawn correctly, and, and because there aren't, enough of, there, there aren't enough participants in the actual trial itself. So we have to kind of pick them up, and because the p-value is very sensitive to participant numbers. Okay, so that's the reason why you do it. And that's another reason why drawing an accurate representative sample is useful, or is, is absolutely critical. Okay, so, as we've said before, there's no 100% certainty in any of this. We all have just confidence in whether this is correct. Okay? So we can, have a 90, we can be 95% confident this is correct, 99% confident this is correct. 
based on what your p-value comes out to. And the p-value means that the results you've got are not down to random chance. Okay? Doesn't mean that they're significant. Doesn't mean that I'll mean that the difference of um, okay, so it doesn't mean that they're practically significant. It does, it, there might be a difference of two pence between the price at Tesco's and the price at Asda on every shop. All you know is that that, that 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 chance is not down to random chance. Okay, but whether a two p you care about, that's up to you. It's not significant. It might not be significant. Whether a two p saving is enough to care about. Okay, so. We have a number of different um, terms that you should be aware of, so circle these in your notes. So we have behaviour, and this is equated to the user. Okay? We have stimulus equated to the interface of the computer in this case. Observable response. It's kind of straightforward, right? You can see this is on page 209 in the variables. We have the independent variable, this is the thing that you'll mostly see in most of the kind of psychological and psychology and social sciences sort of tests. Independent variables, the things we're going to manipulate, and the dependent variables, the things that we're going to measure. Yeah. Now, how to measure them? Well, we have different ways of measuring these things on different kinds of scales. Okay? And this tells us these different kinds of scales allows us to understand what statistical tests we can use, or what tests at all we can use, or what we can say. So we have this nominal scale which denotes identity. Okay, so a nominal scale might be comp 33512, it might be comp 33516, it might be comp 33517, and there's just a list. Okay, it doesn't have any significance at all, it's just a list. Okay? Ordinal scale, which denotes Identity and magnitude. Okay. So we might have something that is, oh, I don't know, something at 10 a.m. and something at 8 p.m. and something at 12 p.m. Okay. You've then got an interval scale, but well, this has the benefit of equal <coughs> intervals. Okay. So the intervals between each of those things are equal. And then you've got a ratio scale. Now, the way that you can understand this is, can, at the bottom one, can you do multiplication, multiplication or division on the scale that you have? So if you have a scale between 1 and 5, can you do multiplication and division on that so that you get something back? Okay. And, that, and if you can, that means you've got appropriate ratio. That's the difference. It's, it's a strange thing. These things here... Dependent variables are a strange way of doing things. And it's difficult to see them without an actual experiment being undertaken, but we will see that next week. Okay, so next week it will become clearer, I'd imagine. Okay? If it doesn't become clearer next week when we go through this practically, then you need to let me know so that I can go through this again practically. Yeah? Okay. Um, I think we've done the hypothesis testing part. It must be strong. Okay. Nothing's ever proved. So this is what is this proved, not proved in every work. We don't know what we just said. So we've got a 10 minute coffee break. So I expect you back. This is what's wrong. Oh look, you should be back around. Um, this box wrong, so it's going back at 5 2 when we'll be starting our thought works um, session. You can see that also next to the notes there's some ThoughtWorks cards there that you should take um, to understand what I do. Okay, go for a coffee and come back in 10 minutes, no later, no slacking.
I was going to say, 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 I was going to say
A lot of the a lot of the old So, I'll ask a few questions as we go, and I'll give you another chance to ask questions a little bit later on as well. So, 
So where do we start? So typically clients come to us with a question in mind. So we're working at the moment with the co-op, uh, the property group, a particular group. So they've come to us and said, we, we don't have a mobile presence, what can we do with mobile? So it's a very open question that they've asked us. So other, other uh, uh, we might be asked very um, greenfields things, we've got no digital strategy whatsoever, we've got, we, uh, we're not online at all. Or it might be very, very narrow. It might be we want to build um, something to help customers self-manage their account. So very narrow, what's the best way to do that? So we need to fit in with their technical architecture, we need to create the best customer experience for them in a very narrow sense. So there's a range of questions. So, so we often start with a clean slate, the business comes to us. So in order to take the example, so we're working with a cooperative at the moment, and if we took that question, where do we start um, for a mobile presence, what comes to mind? Where would you start? What questions would you need to ask that client before we started to do some work for them? What comes to mind? What do we need to know about? What do you think about presence to do for the customer? Yeah, so what will it do for the customer? Absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah. What does your current traditional presence do? Yeah, what, do, what are you doing right now? Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Who are your users? Yes, who's, who are your users? Yeah, and by that you mean, who do you mean by that? Uh, so what kind of, uh, what kind of customers are you getting? What, uh, so, you know, what, what focus is your business on? Are you yeah. on low income earners, middle income earners, but not only just job, but, uh, you know, uh, cultural values. Yeah, absolutely. So that comes on the broad question of who are your customers? So who are they? And I was going to ask, well, what do they mean really by mobile? Yeah, great question. So, um, they're all good questions. There's no answers to them in the first day. So what we bring in is we have to come up with a, an approach to say how do we get to a, a common understanding so we know who the customers are, what the current, what they're doing right now, and where they want to get to. So what is what do they mean by mobile? So that's a, this is an example of a really broad one. So we will, the approach that we take is we actually ask them to get a room for us. Like, so we typically work on client site, we ask them for space. And then we bring everyone in and invite all the different stakeholders. So we, if we can, we can bring some of their customers in. But typically we're bringing in those business stakeholders. They may be marketing, they may be technology people. We try and get a range of people and bring them into the room and actually start to work together to answer those questions. We use a lot of these. <laughs> um, in fact, it's probably the most thing you'll notice from a thoughtless project is like we wallpaper the room, the room with post-it notes. We try to have all sketches. We work very visually. Um, very collaboratively. So it ends up looking, and so we start off, and you can see in a room we have activities, so it's very important to understand the scope. What is it that the business actually wants us to do, and what don't they want us to do? We really need to do, so we do a series of activities to say what's the objective here. And it typically ends up looking like this. <laughs> so that's a bit crazy. Uh, so it's not good for people who like things neat. So, so it is actually personally challenging to work this way for the most part, yeah. yeah look. How do you like search like that load this information if you know if, okay. if there's like hundreds great, of them? Great, great question. I just go back to this. You see there's a title on the poster. They are really, really important. <laughs> there is it's actually a very rigorous approach. We we plan activities and then we run that activity and it's really important that uh, we capture that at the end of the day. So we do an activity during the day, capture it somehow. Maybe it's a photo, we might actually do something so it's easy to read and then we start fresh the next day. So this would be the end of a day's work, maybe the end of two days' work, but it's, it is, it's a really good question. And that's a challenge, because when you're working together, you just have to, you know, you need to know what you're up to. So we'll typically start with business questions, so what's the scope, what's the objective, who are we targeting, what's the business value, and then we start to move on to ask questions about the customers. So we need to understand who it is we're designing for. Are they internal people? Is it for a staff focused thing? Or is it external customers? So in this case for the for the cooperative, we're looking at people who go into their supermarkets and buy food. That's target. So we don't know anything more than that at this stage. That's all we know. So so we do then do um, we do, uh, do personas. We do have a sense of who the focus is for them and they have a they have identified who they think the target should be. So and I say that and that evolve, and personas are something that evolves. Who we're designing for, we have a bit of an idea at the beginning, but we get a clearer and clearer picture as we go. But it's good to start with photos of people in the room, 
so that to remind us that we're building for people. So uh, we also need to know about uh, your own customer journeys. So this is what the customer experience is like. So they start off, it's a bit hard to read, but the blue steps are what the customer does. They might have a different types of shops that they might go in, uh, in the sense they do different types of shopping. So they go into the store for just a weekly shop, for example, or they just go in to buy a few things. So the business people can tell us all that. So they are experts in this. And so we do this together. And uh, then, so this would have been post-it notes on the wall and we've distilled it down into this so we can get a lot of information on, on one thing. So we're not expected to read it at this size, but it's a starting point to give us a reference. Because what we really want to know is, where in this are there opportunities for us to introduce mobile? Because we don't know yet. So if you imagine someone walking into a shop, when would they use the mobile before, um, when you go to do your shopping? Anyone got any ideas? When would you possibly use mobile? There's a little place for a shopping list so you yeah. can keep track or you can track products in store so if you can't find a product you might be an actual sell them for a problem with it. Yeah, so it's a shopping list. So that's an example of an opportunity. So you might overlay that and say where is that in context? Then there is, um, yeah, so that's what you need to do. So um, now, if you, have, if you have no research done at all, this is a technique that we use quite often, is if there is any recordings at all of customers calling in, you can play it back into, into the room and you can hear firsthand people desperately trying to get help from the call centre. So it's, um, it's very powerful. So this was one where it was for cable television and we replayed in people calling in to, um, to find out about what they were doing to get some help. And uh, there were things like they had been given free access to channels but they didn't know about it so they're saying, I haven't watched it, I might be charged for it, things like that. So it's, it's really powerful to listen firsthand and the type of language that the customers are using. So we might need to do techniques like this. So any other ideas? If you were having a workshop, so if we were actually trying to help the co-op and trying to come up with, get a sense of who their customers are, are there any techniques that you can think of that are really fast where you could bring some data into a workshop? Any ideas? No? Maybe you could have, sorry, um, uh, like a timeline of sales throughout the day, for example, in yeah. one of their shops. Yeah. You know, when when is the most popular time to go shopping? Um, whether they know what they buy at that time, yeah. who the sort of demographic is, that kind of thing. Absolutely. So um, a little bit less about the demographic, but they do know shopping patterns. So they do know what products sell, what time they sell, what the highest values are that sell, which which stores sell which things. So so organisations typically have sales information that can help build a bit of a picture, absolutely. A bit of a sense of, so other, yeah. But are they having to disclose your information to you? Yes. We, just, we sign non-disclosure agreements at the beginning of the project. Mm -hmm. so, um, and actually that's a good point. It's like it's important to build trust very early so that they will not only give us what we ask for but make suggestions of what other information that they have. It's a really good point. Um, so, yeah, so we'd hunt around in the organisation to see what else it is. So sometimes it's better just to bring people who are actually who work in the stores into the workshop, for example. And they should tell you stories about people that they've met and what they do. Sometimes you can actually bring actual customers in, if that makes sense. So the call recordings are another one. Uh, so analytics, you can actually get analytics, use of analytics if there is any web presence. They do have a website. So search terms are another one, useful thing. So you're actually looking around for a different source of information that we can get to really quickly and bring in and help set the scene about who the customers are. Uh, this is one where we do a field visit. So this was uh, going out, so this is for the cable television, going into a shopping centre and watching the sales, watching them sell, and then recreating it. So, this, so uh, the salesperson's on the left there and on the, on the right is, is uh, my colleague sort of reenacting it basically and so we capture what the current process is what happened for sales so you can see that they go uh, they, they get someone's attention bring them to the product and talk about them then they have to go around to the counter fill out a form and then then this is, this is the system we're looking to really re develop here and, what, and while we're there we've got an idea that maybe we can actually improve that and so while we're out there we just reenacted the, um, the shorter version of the process so you're prototyping a process so just getting ideas so, and then you bring that role play in, so you can see you've got the photos in the back bring into the workshop. 
then we need to, okay, so we've got an idea of the people, we've got an idea of the problems, we need to just generate ideas. Again, we are very good. So, where do ideas come from? So, and any, any thoughts? Where do you get ideas? So we say, yeah, there's a problem, we're going to redesign this particular system, where does an idea come from? Discussion. Discussion, yeah, discussion. Observing other things, actually in the field. Yeah, any other thoughts? So this was just a bit of a summary. So where ideas come from is um, in anywhere basically. So looking at competitors from observ observing, um, asking customers, showing them ideas from the business people themselves. They come from anywhere. And we actually make a point of trying to inspire generating ideas. So, so that we can come out of, out of the workshop with something. So, and this is where there's quite a big change I think from, a, from what designers normally do. So designers don't just design, they really facilitate. So we actually work in a room together, everyone's generating ideas together. And what we want to do is rapidly generate those ideas so that we've got something to work with. And I think that's a key skill um, that we need to develop, is actually how to facilitate. So how do you make people feel comfortable so that they are in a position to generate ideas? Because how do, um, I don't know, have you ever been in a situation where you're under pressure? So for example, if I sort of said, I really need you to design something, for the car, and we've got four minutes to do it. Does that generate pressure? Do you think you operate well in that environment? <laughs> okay, the answer is we do actually. So a constraint is good, but as a facilitator, you have to keep people comfortable enough to be happy with that. So we typically do give them time constraints to generate an idea and do several rounds. But you have to have a skill as a, as a facilitator to keep it, keep it flowing, keep it going, and be able to tell when we're getting nothing, when is it time to stop and change direction. So I think that's a, that's a key thing, is how to facilitate, how to keep people comfortable so that they're not terrified. <coughs> so, um, do sometimes intentionally terrify people. I don't know, it's just a habit. <laughs> but only for a short time. For example, I get people do these things like draw faces, people are terrified of drawing paint faces. So, but you do it in a really soft way, and just the way just to, to shake it up a little bit. Because you want to push people a little bit. So then we end up with a lot of ideas. So, and we do this as a result of three rounds of generating ideas. We work in small groups. And so you can see that this is the room. So you can see that there's three groups here. So you can see how many ideas you can generate quite quickly. Each round would have been about five minutes, three times, so 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And we've generated you know, close to 100 ideas that we can then draw from. And then we can cherry pick those ideas and use that as a starting point for something. So this was what they produced from the, the co-op. So as a designer, you might redraw it, or you might leave it in a raw state, which is like this. So it's hand-drawn. You can see on the, on the left there, it's hand-drawn. Or you can just summarise it visually. So these were all the ideas that we came up with. So probably the shopping list is probably one of those ideas in there somewhere. So now we have a lot of ideas. So out of that workshop, as an example, we end up with 21 ideas. But how do we bring it down? Any ideas? If you got, so in this case, we end up with 21 ideas. How would you start to bring it in? How would you make a choice? What's a good idea or not? Or would you start to test 21 ideas? What would you do? So you say pass them up to try and say if Yeah, absolutely. Because? Eliminate the ones that are, you know, aren't maybe that attractive and then like... You know, yeah, eliminate the blue ones, ones, for example. Yeah. For instance, yeah. <laughs> Yes, you can start to, yeah, so what we need is a process of elimination. Yeah, what does attractive mean? So we need a, a way to actually reduce it down. So, testing. So we can actually do a little bit of testing in the workshop itself, just with the business people, to give a sense, can a human use it? So it doesn't matter if they're on the target, but as a start, just to get a bit of a sense of it. Uh, the other thing that we can do is um, check for technical feasibility. Can we actually build it? And we might say, yes, we can build and put, rank them in order. Okay, this is the easiest to build, this is the most complex to build. And just see, what do you think of that idea? Do you think that's, a few people are nodding, do you think that's a great? Yeah, would that be, what would you think would you be your top criteria for putting them in order of we want to do this first and number 21 last? Yeah. Uh, you could have a mixture of value to the customer yeah. against complexity or time to build. Yeah. Yes. So, customer, customer and? And you can time to build, so you want the highest revenue for the shortest of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, it's because of the highest value in Mountain as well, so what will bring the most uh, profit to a business at the end of the day. But maybe what they want to do is find yeah. a way of it. Absolutely. So if you think about... Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So if you think about all of the different people in that room, so some people are technical, so from a technical point of view you want it to be, what do you want if you're technical? What do you want? What's the most important thing? It's features. Piece of, sorry? Features. Features. That's right. <laughs> Sometimes they say we just want the best, the coolest technology to use. Okay, that's a great way of looking at it. Um, so technically feasible, can you actually do it? Yeah, so but business value, you know, what is it going to bring the most, that we think is going to bring the most profit in? How do we know that? We don't actually know that at that point, we, we're still guessing. Um, yeah, and customers in there as well. So this is what we did for the, the co-op. So, so exactly that, so you've actually taken an idea, put that on the left. So this one idea is people log in, my co-op. And then we're ranking, as people said, so the top one is, so these are just criteria, say so customer need, impact of operating model means business impact. So for example, if you, there was, there was one idea where people could actually go and shop online, but they actually have to change how they run the stores, for example, to actually do the, the delivery aspect of it. So there's some things that have very big business impact. So, and, so these were all the criteria. Any thoughts? Yeah. I was just about to ask what we from. <laughs> so these are what's important to the cooperative. So um, so leapfrog means over the competition. So so you can see that the customer need for this is fairly low. Uh, the impact is very high to the business. Uh, introduction start running. So I guess getting going quickly. And leapfrog you know does it leapfrog? Not really because lots of people have that have that capability. But these are intel, so you would actually choose together what would be the most important thing. So I don't see technical specifically in there, but that's something that's always, that we always need to consider. Any thoughts so far? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I might just be misunderstanding. Um, was the whole idea for the co op going into this mobile thing, was it purely to, um, you know, maximise profit and therefore one of the key metrics for deciding which features to choose is how much value this is going to add to the business. Mm. But is it ever a case that it's not so hinging on the, the, the monetary value rather than the connection and sort of reach with your customer base? Yes. You know, in terms of loyalty or recurring customers and all that kind of thing, that doesn't seem to be here at all, is that ever, is that ever okay? It is, absolutely. So there's a range of reasons, and actually, in fact, I think that's true in this case too. So they're trying to say customer need, not not sales. That's not the highest right. the highest thing there. So they are genuinely talking about what the customers really need and how can we do it, how can we meet that need. It may be ultimately to force sales, um, but it's always a, it's a mixture. You can't just say, what are, we, what are we going to make the most money on, even for a business context. So there are projects, for example, pro bono ones we do, it's nothing to do with money at all, it's actually saving lives. Or, so we really, they're really good projects to do because it's good to do a project where if you get it wrong, people will die. That's good. It creates, it creates a good focus. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think that same focus is still needed for these type of things as well. What is the most important thing you can do that will improve people's lives? Because even if you're actually, say, designing a shopping list, that can actually add value to people's lives. They might, so in this climate, you want to actually help people maybe save money or, I don't know, live better in some way, whatever that is. So I think that is, is really good. I try not to be flippant about the death thing, but we, we, um, we're we working on a project called Rapid FTR, which is mobile, a mobile system to match up people after disasters. So after a disaster, children get separated from parents. We know that in the first hour, first few hours, is the most critical time to match them back before they can fall victim to people who steal children. So, or just, you know, not, not be fair or not be careful. So the, the application is completely driven about what's the fastest way to match those children with those parents. So it's a really good point about motivation why I'm doing these projects. And it should be reflected in how you make judgment about which direction you can go. It's actually quite easy to generate a lot of ideas. 
quite difficult to say which direction we should be actually going. Any other thoughts? It's interesting about, just a, a, question, a personal question for you, is what are you primarily motivated by? So you're, te are you te all technologists? All doing computer science? Right. So what do you think, what's the most exciting thing for you? What do you think is your primary driver is when you graduate? Do you think it's you want to work on things where you're going to make the most money, like the high salary? Or what is it, have you thought about it? Personally? Who's motivated by the high salary? Some. Okay, so people who are not, so that's easy, that's such a simple measure, but it's fair. Any others? Sorry? An honest answer. An honest answer, absolutely, it's great. Uh, any other thoughts? If, you, if it's not money, what is it? What's the most important thing you, when you get a job? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, working on interesting projects, doing things that long before. Right, great. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think being able to think differently mm -hmm. uh, rather than being stuck to doing nine to five every day. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's good. So it's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Making, uh, <laughs> yes. What sort of impact? Do you think that? It's all like it's kind of I kind of have that idea where it's trying to help um, help you help with anyone to uh, increase their happiness in life. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you can actually have a positive impact with the work that you do. That's great. Yeah. So you enjoy the challenges you. Yeah. So yeah. So what you enjoy and challenging. That's that, what sort of things challenging. What you're in which way? Anyway. Or? Uh, something, that, yeah. uh, something that you don't find easier, I think, is basically, I think, what's your one where your brain wants to get full and yeah. develop a bit, whereas if you're constantly going to be on your feet, on your toes, and yeah. trying to work out problems, really, I think. Yeah, you're, you're enjoying it more. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's good. I mean, it's good to so uh, it's good to uh, acknowledge your own motivations in these projects. It's also good to recognise people have different motivations when they're coming into it. So I generally don't. Some people are very focused on the financial outcome for sure. You know, in some business areas, but I wouldn't say that's universally true at all. So it's a range. It's more complex than that. And what we try to do actually is, as when you're doing user experience, I think we kind of teach empathy. So as soon as people see the impact of what they're doing on other people. They do actually shift, and it's really quite nice to see. So, um, so I try to get so all developers, everyone in the team, try to get them included on user testing firsthand. If not, take video and share things back. Everything we find to make it, or we'll go out on a site visit, you know, go out into the shops and see what's, what's actually happening. So this was our, back to our, our customer journey map. So we've generated a lot of ideas, and we've got some problem areas and some opportunities in here. So we overlay where we can possibly solve them with these ideas. So these ideas fit in, in these contexts. And then we start to zero in, based on our sliders, into three areas. So we've got three, and then we've narrowed it down. So we narrowed it down into the deals, so the shopping lists, actually, and uh, my car. Which one would you choose? As a, as a shopper. Do you shop? Does everyone shop for food? Anybody not shop for food? No? Sometimes people outsource that. So, um, so of those three things, which one would be most useful for you? Yeah. I think my car, only because carps are one of shops, it's not like a big brand, you don't really have any yep. affiliation with it, you can't really relate to it. But I suppose my car gives almost like a personal feel. Usually carps just, yeah, I can't find the same because I've got been there. Right, okay. So what would my, my car give you? It'll, it'll make you almost feel like you're part of a group that give it the same brand and more. Seems to me that you can't have the two on the left without having the one on the right. Uh, I mean, you could definitely have some right. sort of standalone application mm -hmm. uh, where you don't need to log in to do the, you know, the deals or whatever. But chances are the call probably, probably mm -hmm. manages. Yeah. Okay. So that's an assumption there. So about what what they want. Absolutely. So yeah. Any other thoughts? There are lots of universal so you find in the shopping list. I mean, you know, yeah, wherever you are, it's not always a call, so you just need something quick to sell out the shopping list. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, right. So, 
we have to um, all agree, and when we say all, people from the, all of the different perspectives, what the best one is. So, so we say that's what we have the sliders. So we, so we took the sliders to get it down to these three, and then we did some additional, uh, additional criteria, so another four or five criteria to, to choose which one. We actually decided on the deals. Uh, the reason for is technically simple. Uh, it's easy to do rapidly, um, so there's, there's no internal barriers. So my comment relies on members. That's quite challenging to do, it turns out. So in terms of business impact. Um, the shopping list wasn't seen as a differentiator enough, and so the deals were turned into. Um, so we ended up with something, that, this is from a different project, but you end up with, so choosing the deals, we then draw out what we think the flow will be. We start drawing out, and so we do a few more rounds and end up with something that looks like the vision of what we're going to start with. So we, we started four weeks ago. So the first two weeks was it's very similar to what I showed you so far. So now we've got a sense of who the, who the customers are, a sense of what we're going to start to build. Uh, we've got everybody aligned internally, so all of the business people, everyone's agreed that this is what we're going to build, because we've all been in there together. And then we start to, um, then start to break up that work, and we start to cut some code. So we keep the sketchboard running all the time, and we keep referring to it, so when we do user testing, it goes, the comments go onto the board, so we have a bit of a sense of what we're building all the time. And it's, it's open, it's not just the design strategy. And then we break it down. Does everyone know about stories? So instead of the word requirements, we use the word stories. So break it down and have uh, user goals at the top, and then the pieces of work. And it's in order that is of highest value. So way down the left, and this is this is a really good room. We have a long wall. Um, you can, the, the very top of the user goals, and then underneath it are the requirements of the user stories. So all the pieces of work are broken down, and we start to build by picking up the first story. And then a pair will work on that story, a pair of developers. So you do some analysis on the first, you put the design, if we've got any design work with it, it goes with that story, and it's picked up and we start to build. And so the idea is you start building from highest value first, highest to the customer, typically, and then we start to test it. So building only is really, really important. So so just for, for yourselves, have you do you always um, do you prototype already? Or do you, are you already doing rapid build kind of things? Prototyping? That's been more abstract. So sometimes we'll actually even go from paper to code. We may not go to, it depends on what it is. So you might see some pairing happening, or we might go through high fidelity, so you might do maybe Photoshop visual design, or you may not, we might do very sketchy looking things. It's, it really depends on what we've got. But we have a principle where everyone's working together, so you've actually got designers and developers working together, but analysts, or it might be people from the customer site, so it might have someone from the co-op sitting there, so I typically will pair with uh, the subject matter expert. So, just, so if you have a domain, we have some people who actually do specialise in different domains, but mostly we have to change domains all the time. So working in ThoughtWorks, we are constantly changing where we're working and the domains. So some people try and stay in a, in a similar vein, but it's, it's generally going across different domains all the time. So you're picking up new every single time. And say, so, uh, just generally, from uh, from where you're expecting to go, are you looking to sort of stay based in Manchester, or are you looking to travel? Who likes traveling? <laughs> so the challenge is if you want to stay still, actually. So when you're doing consulting work, so we're going go where the work is. So I'm I'm based in Sydney normally, and uh, in the last twelve months I've been through, been in the north in uh, Chester and in India, a little bit London in Brussels and here. So that's a little bit unusual, I have to say. <laughs> but it's not unusual to travel a lot to go to with it. The reason that I left was because there was a there was a um, there wasn't enough work in Australia at the time, so they said go to another part of the, the globe somewhere because we've got a, a sort of global presence. So that's quite interesting. But it's it's a skill also is actually starting picking up and moving to different places, but it might be just different different clients around Manchester. So but there is definitely a lot of movement, and you get to, to see lots of different things. The advantage of that is you get to sort of experience a wide range of things. I think if there's a disadvantage, you don't tend to go down into a domain so much. You have to really work at it if you really want to specialise in a domain. So, 
Um, this principle of bringing users in, so we were talking before in the previous lecture about getting the right data. So what we tend to do is very rapidly bring in users. So, and actually bring them in even into the, into the project room initially. We start on paper, give them activities to do, testing on, what, on paper screens, and just get that going as quickly as possible. What do you think the problem with just doing that is? What would we lose if we just do that? Natural surroundings of the user? Yeah, natural surroundings. Yeah. So, for the co-op, the co what do you think we should do? So, thinking about helping people with mobile who are shopping, what do you think we would, could do to balance that? Put it in a shop. Put it in a shop. Yeah, that's an idea. What else? I mean, would you rely on, so let's say, we can, we can reasonably get two, maybe four people at the most a week through the project. The project is going to run for eight weeks. Is that going to be enough user research, do you think? Is that good enough? Not for that size project. No, the company already felt the own test quite a lot. It's been set up for many people. Yeah, so I think it's the point that was made earlier, you know, is, is that good enough? Is that going to really give you what you need? It's really interesting, um, talking to two people, which we did last week, so we sort of started the sort of build part of it last week, and so we got the users in the first week, we got brought two people in, we had to actually recruit from internal, so we tried to find people who hadn't been in the company too long, so they were graduates, they had to be smartphone users, that was the only criteria basically that they use a smartphone, and weren't too familiar, weren't familiar with what we were building, and, and the insight was extraordinary really, um, so you get it actually raises more questions, so you don't get answers very often out of this early system. It's an, at an exploratory stage. So you're trying to explore how people shop, so you do storytelling techniques, sort of open, more open techniques. So um, and we test on paper, so paper prototyping, but also blank screen, so they get them to design it on blank for nothing. So, um, yeah, so it works quite well. Was there a question there? We then evolved from paper into sort of a prototype, and you just sort of see this is actually as a result of a, uh, a session that we did a through, doing a user test of some kind or a session, but even then get quickly get ideas and then quickly write them up and say, is that what you mean? So change it on screen, and then just take a photo of it as well, capturing that, that feedback. So it's very, very fast. You're trying to find very quickly run those sessions, yeah. So a thing like that is um, the prototype platform is independent, so you wouldn't, wouldn't be found to order for iOS when you're doing these early. That's a really, a really good point. That's around the, so on this project, there was a really lot of discussion because the business wanted an app. Typically, they want apps. And the problem with, what's the problem with having an app as a starting point? So you're starting a decision between Android or iOS. Any other problems with starting with an app? The user has to download it. The user has to download it. Is that correct? Right? What else? The user has to initiate updates. Yes, the, the user has to be initiated. Is that what you think, sorry? Uh, well, if there's an update, then you can't oh, just... The they have to download the update. <coughs> yep, absolutely. Um, maybe not in the UK, but there's a lot of people around the world who don't have smartphones, rely on... don't even have internet on the phone, or have internet in a simple browser. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the question is, are we just... So, are we designing for those people? So this is again scope. It's like we have to be... We can... We don't have to be universal. So we are designing for people who do, so we are designing for people who have smart, smartphones, fairly smartphones, and are fairly comfortable with them, because we can't design for everyone, so that I think is, the, is a focus, but it's a good point. It's, it's who are we ignoring and eliminating, and are they the key customers that we should be targeting? So, you know, so that's, that's a really good question. There's another question right here. Just to say how backwards or forward compatible to make it, like, yes. with Android, what you can idea in that? Yeah, exactly right. So, so where do you own it? So where do you picture? So this was a, a question that came up very quickly because the business came in, which is very, it's very common. Uh, we want an app, or we want something. Uh, so we were able to sort of shift around, so to say, we actually suggest that you start with a website, a mobile website, for several reasons. One is that it's very rapid. You don't, people don't have to download it. We can be a lot more universal. Um, we can learn very quickly without it being. Because people also brought up the point is if you're downloading the app and you get a bad comment, that's it, it's all over. For example. So there is lower risk all round. Um, we're starting with website first, and then if, and actually take the time to do some research because we couldn't do lots of research at the beginning, and learn do people actually want an app? Actually, create, turn it into a question rather than make an assumption. Just because the business said 
And we may lose that. We might, they might just say, we don't care, we just want it out. And we go, okay. But we can make recommendations. And so this, so we've got a strategy with this one is to build a mobile website first and then to see if there's a need for that. But that's a common thing that the, you have the, from a technology point of view, you become humans, you have to make a recommendation. So we suggest these technologies for this reason, knowing that we want to build quickly <coughs> and get to market quickly. So we're trying to get to market, if we can, in less than three months instead of the normal two years. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's the approach. And technology is really a key part of that decision. As is, so both of us, so we have a very continuous way of working. So you're continually um, developing, but we're also continually bringing in user data from wherever we can do it, customer data, sometimes business data. So, so just, just to check, so often when we're planning these sort of things, you, you, have to, you have to make the decision. So if you're the consultants, you're making recommendations to a client. You've got to suggest techniques. So just from a UX point of view, what sort of techniques would you be suggesting that you do? So imagine that we're starting to build. So we're just building a bit. What sort of things would you be doing every week from a UX point of view? Thoughts? You could be uh, aiming to fail fast and get feedback uh, at small iterations rather than building a massive piece of software and the user saying what's too keen, we've got to change it again. Yes. So if we, yeah, so it's really about narrow bit, but how narrow can we go? If we take the shopping list as an example, what do you think is the smallest piece that we could build for a shopping list? What would you start with? An app that just lets you type lines of text. So you can just write the items you need. And that would be very basic. And then you could add functionality to like tick off item, then add functionality for it to check the prices online. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So first of all it's just, just a text list. There's no checking. So you could start there's no login required, it's open perhaps. So it's just you start off and say what's the smallest thing that's going to have nice value. So we're very much working in that way and then say, do people use it at all? The whole principle of this is maybe no one wants wants it at all. In which case we stop after eight or twelve weeks instead of stopping after a year. So that's really the the, the real value of the working. So these are the agile principles, which are we do things very collaboratively. And so just a question about seeing that so everyone's working together, pairing and so on. Does anyone sort of see that this way of working and think I hate it? Yeah. You know what? Not really, no. I'm just wondering about the different types of people there are there and people who might have um, talents that only emerge when they're given the chance to work individually and in a more quiet setting. So how do you handle that? It's a really, it's a really good point. So it's not collaborative, well it's not, we're not all in a room all the time, all the time, and there certainly are some activities where you need some staring out the window time, or you need to go away and think about stuff. So it is a balance. So it is collaborative in the sense that if you're going off and doing something on your own, you bring back what you find and share it. So I think it's a really good point, but it really is. We have had particularly business stakeholders freak out sometimes because it's, it does look really messy and it looks, and it's actually really hard to think. Um, there's not a lot of thinking time sometimes, so it's, um, you have to create that space. And I think as a facilitator, you have to allow for that, give people downtime and get people used to it. Yeah, so is that a question? Do you ever find this approach means that if your client says to you how much is it going to cost me, mm -hmm. you know, if you budget in all the time scale, it's quite hard and learning as you go. It is. It's a challenge. Um, so we typically will give them either share how it's worked before. You do have to fix a time though. You have to do something in a certain amount of time because you have to actually give people um, a business of a price. So we do. It's, it's, it's true, but not many people like it. Don't worry about the cost, we'll just build something, we'll learn something, you'll get something. We don't know what that will be, that doesn't go down very well when you try and sell them to the first time. But once people have worked this way, so we try and do sort of pilot things or smaller things, where it's lower risk from a business point of view. That's a good point though. It's a big challenge. Um, the other thing is multifunctional teams, it's really, really important. So we work together. So again, I, su I suppose you're already multifunctional in the sense that you're doing computer science, but you're also doing this unit as well. So you're already doing two functions. So do you see yourself so, doing the design work? Anyone see it yet? No? Who says no? Okay. No? Do you know why not? 
because I like working in a lower level with yeah. I I am I like the concept of design mm -hmm. but I prefer working on a lower level. You prefer working on, on a lower level. level. Absolutely. And uh, but the value of this is you have an awareness. So you don't actually have to do it. That's why a non profit team is really good because you can share the things that you really like doing and you can get someone else to do the things you hate doing, which is what's really nice about it. So we had this uh, discussion before is when people come in and start a thought work, they go, well, I'm an experienced designer, what do I do? Or what don't I do? Do I do all the design? So the it's, it's in, in every project, in every team, you discuss it. So well, what's going to work for me and what's not? So, so we'll need some support on visual design, so we just ask for that support and bring that in. Uh, the do enough to learn, so that was that idea of doing small about, don't think about absolutely everything. Again, that can be quite challenging. What do you think about that idea? So we don't know everything the app will do or the website will do before we start. Does that, what do you think of that idea? So maybe we would prefer to know everything before they started. No one? Yes? Yeah. It's, I would have. Yeah. It would be easy to build them. Yes. <laughs> That's fine. So, and, and a lot of people... <coughs> And uh, a lot of people want that. They want to say, what is that whole thing? And sometimes it's a very critical system. You do have to do something. You know, if you've got lives at stake or this, we have to really think it through. You'll give it that time. But if there's an opportunity to do it, I a small version of it and learn as you go. Because the challenge is, if you design it all, we might start and no one wants any of it. Or we might to, to change direction quite quickly. So this is that idea of being adaptable by doing a small bit first. The, the smallest that makes sense. Sometimes that's, that's big. Yeah, so learning as you go, very typical. So it's very challenging. I think someone made a point about being challenged. So the challenges come from the roles, from the technology, from the clients, from different sites, and the different problems all the time. But we, the value is actually not the document that you produce. So the sketches are not the value. The value is actually having this, the working software that people are using. That's where the value is. So the idea of working this way is to get away from what happened. You can have you drive it and just build it and hope people will use it. So we're taking the hope away from it and actually trying to fill this more Okay, that's pretty that's challenging to read. But this is a challenging approach. Personally, it's challenging uh, to start working this way. It's often challenging for clients. So the speed that we work at, working collaboratively, often have to fly people in from where they don't normally do it. And um, as designers, you have to have facilitation skills. And the last one, as consultants, we have to give people time to accept change. So I have had cases where going into um, the threat to be thrown off the site in two hours of walking on, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> but just from asking questions, asking the wrong, well not the wrong questions, but asking questions, things like asking for the, the data. So what data do you have from a marketing point of view? But it's because people say, well that's my domain, why are you asking? You're, a tech, you're in the technology team. So that was, so it was really interesting, so I've learned to ask those questions a little bit gentler. <laughs> Permission first. So I would say as an advice going, it is actually really confronting for clients who don't don't work this way. They just don't know what they're going to get. Um, so uh, so that's actually that's that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Is that people skills is build trust first, which is what I would say first, and then start asking questions. Um, so often we're also making the case for change. So sometimes we have to say why we're we doing it this way. So often you're convincing or explaining, quickly drawing things on a whiteboard some kind of model, some kind of visualising what it is that we're trying to do so people get it. And it might be just a circle and say we're going to use the learn, or it might be drawing the technology stack and explaining apps versus, so we have to convince and sort of say why apps versus the web, mobile website as a start. Uh, and often we're sort of more coaching in a way, so sitting and pairing than necessarily, well we do, we do the work as well, but it's a real mixture. So you're not only just sitting there and just doing your job because you're working with people all the time and this but you're very immersed in the technology there's, there's no shortage of technology and there's a lot of um, opportunity to do that but I'm saying when you're working on a client site you are visible there's no hiding no. <laughs> um, so we have this idea of the continuous that continuous design and continuous delivery so Jess Humble has written about continuous delivery is it that's something you're coming across already in your Computer science things, yeah. continuous integration, continuous delivery, but also continuous design. So continually doing, continually doing research, continually doing design. It's really important. That uh, 
and there's that what it looks like. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I've got to, to, to show in terms of the, the projects themselves. I'm mindful of this one's not great or something. In five minutes. Yeah, so I just wanted to know if there's any other questions. Yeah. yeah, just wondering with the uh, uh, programming, how do you kind of get assigned to uh, another person? I mean, what do you take into account? Oh, how do you get paired up, you yeah, mean, yeah. and get assigned? Uh, you just talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, so on a team, so we we size a project based on what's called a dev pair, so two developers pairing is how you size a project in, in a way. So that's like the key kind of measure we're looking at, because there's generally more developers than anyone yeah. on a project. So, particularly when they're working pairs. So, do you do that normally as well? Sort of pairing up and working in pairs for your development? No, not necessarily. Okay. So, this is something that for, for when people start in developing, that's quite hard to get used to as well. So, but uh, being assigned is it's a mixture. You, but basically, you just talk. So. <laughs> so. I think that might be called plagiarism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> that, that's okay. the thing. It probably would be. <laughs> I suppose that's true. Um, okay. <laughs> but, it's, but it's very, very effective because you get better quality code when you do it that way. So because you have to talk about it, agree the approach, you've actually got a keyboard, dual control, two keyboards uh, to one screen, and you obviously have to negotiate who's going to do it off, but basically you're coding and people are seeing it, you get twice the ideas, and it's, it's, it works extremely well. But we'll also pair with, you know, you might be sketching screens and working with someone who's doing a front end development. So that pairing is not just um, not just uh, any pairing. Well, the customer will be sitting there as well. There might be three of us sitting there and sort of making a decision because sometimes it's much easier to see what it actually looks like in code um, than just try and imagine it or even sketch it. So I have been working with a, um, people get really who are really good front end developers will say we would sort of say it'd be nice if we could sort of see you know error messenger a typical one like this, and I'll say, oh, do you mean like this? And he could keep up with the speed we were talking at and just flashing it up on the screen. And it was made it so much easier to make a decision. So, it's really good. so you spoke about projects for other organisations. What if there's, like, so do you allow for creativity within the company? So say a developer has a good idea for an app yeah. for something yeah. like ethical like, for humanity, and they wanted to pursue and do that, would you allow for that, or is it just Specifically for other uh, you pretty much do whatever you like. Um, there are lots of communities that will build up, like people might want to do game design or run communities, code jams all the time, or if you've got an idea for an app. I know we were sort of running the idea internally about a labs idea where people just come up with ideas and just pull them. There's no, there's no real rules around that. I and mean, if you had an idea and you could either want to do it internally and get some help, you could do that, or if you want to do it yourself and put it in through, you could do that as well. There's no limits. It's a very, um, I suppose it's a sort of organisational thing, it's not, it's not a hierarchy as such. People are given a lot of autonomy to make decisions like that. And to explore and learn, you're expected to explore and learn and share back in. But, but yeah, no, this, yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay. No? Alright, well thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank you and uh, good luck. كيف اقعد قهوه معك بعد ستين ونص خلاص Oh, no. 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 Oh,